Hello everyone, I'm Craig Maurer. Welcome to another special report. Today we continue to probe what is perhaps the greatest mystery of this century. Who killed President John F. Kennedy? In our previous special report, we studied the famous backyard photographs of Lee Harvey Oswald, which were used to convict him in the public's mind as President Kennedy's lone assassin. We discovered much evidence to show that those photos were fakes, thus suggesting that a conspiracy not only killed President Kennedy, but set up Lee Harvey Oswald to take the blame. Of course, if this is true, it has serious implications for all of us. Perhaps we could more accurately know what's happening today if we had a clearer understanding of what happened to us in 1963. To arrive at such an understanding, we must start with the one man most closely associated with the assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald. A very odd individual, Oswald had a history and associations far beyond those of other 24-year-olds. At one time or the other, he was connected to the Marines, to communist agents, both pro and anti Castro Cubans, arch conservatives, the Mafia, and even the FBI. Obviously, to come to a good understanding of Kennedy's death, we must take a good close look at the many faces of Lee Harvey Oswald. But before we do that, let's review those terrible days in Dallas during the fall of 1963. At age 46, John F. Kennedy was the youngest American president. He represented a more youthful way of looking at things. Barely defeating Richard Nixon in the 1960 election, Kennedy immediately faced a series of crises. First in Cuba, then in Berlin, and next in Vietnam. He angered many members of the military and military industrial complex by his willingness to negotiate rather than force armed confrontation. He quickly built up a long list of enemies, most of them right here at home. Organized crime bosses plotted against his life because of the crime-busting efforts of his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. The large anti-Castro Cuban community wanted revenge for the ill-fated Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. And the Pentagon and defense contractors were angry over Kennedy's public vow to withdraw United States troops from Asia. Then in the late fall of 1963, the president made a political fence-mending trip to Texas. He was eager to count the populist state among his supporters in the upcoming 1964 election. After visiting San Antonio, Houston, and Fort Worth, Kennedy arrived in Dallas on the morning of November the 22nd. It was here that his path crossed that of Lee Harvey Oswald. Shots were fired into the president's open limousine while his motorcade passed through a small park area on the west end of downtown Dallas known as Dealey Plaza. Rushed to a local hospital, he was pronounced dead shortly after 1 p.m. It was just 40 minutes later that Oswald was arrested in a theater in a South Dallas neighborhood. Although Oswald protested his innocence at every opportunity, the evidence against him grew rapidly. A rifle and spent cartridges were found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, where Oswald had been moving book boxes that morning. A fellow worker claimed that Oswald had brought a package to work with him that day. The Dallas District Attorney proclaimed an open and shut case against the former Marine. When it was announced that Oswald had tried to defect to the Soviet Union, public sentiment turned completely against him. The case seemed settled. But was it settled? Over the years, more and more questions have been raised regarding the government's hasty conclusion that Oswald committed the assassination alone and that no conspiracy existed. Today, there is an abundance of information to show that there were many things going on behind the scenes both before and after the assassination. For example, those of you who saw our last special report will recall that Texas assassination researcher and graphics expert Jack White presented persuasive evidence that this picture of Oswald with his weapons is a fake. We saw the conflicting shadows and contradicting heights and a mysterious chin transplant caused White and other photo experts to conclude that this photo, prime evidence in the case against Oswald, is a clever forgery. Now, for those of you who would like to see this evidence for yourselves and learn more about the JFK assassination, information on our first special report and information on a recent major book will be presented at the end of this program. For an update on the evidence that this photo is a fake, let's join Jack White. Jack, I understand that you've developed still some more information on this very famous photograph. 
Yes, Craig. Recently, I was contacted by a fellow researcher asking a question which prompted me to study yet another issue regarding this famous backyard photograph of Lee Oswald. It is such a simple issue that I was amazed that I had not thought of it before. This is a copy of the tabloid newspaper which can be seen clearly in the hands of the figure in the backyard photo. Since copies of this paper are still available, there is no question of its size. It is 11 inches wide, and as you can see in the backyard photo, it is being held right up next to the person's body. This provides a perfectly accurate scale for measuring the figure's height. If this photo is legitimate, then the size of the newspaper should be proportional to a man five foot nine inches tall, which is the height of Oswald at the time of his autopsy. After scaling a ruler to match the known 11 inches of the newspaper, I measured the Oswald figure and found it was only 59 inches. That's four foot 11 inches, 10 inches shorter than the man killed by Jack Ruby and a full foot shorter than the Marine Oswald, which military records showed was five foot 11 inches. To me, it's obvious that whoever faked this photograph sized the newspapers much too large, making Oswald appear proportionally shorter in comparison. This, coupled with my previous observation of missing fingertips on the right hand and the absence of finger shadows on the newspaper, confirms to me the fact that these incriminating photos of Oswald's were fakes, just as he tried to tell the Dallas police. Well, that really sounds convincing, Jack, but if that's not Oswald, just his face, who, who is the person in the backyard anyway? You know, Jack has a fascinating idea about this, and it relates to a former Dallas policeman named Roscoe White, who was killed in a fire in 1971. You may remember that in the summer of 1990, Roscoe White's son, Ricky, made a national headlines by claiming that his father left behind a diary in which he had confessed to killing both President Kennedy and Dallas policeman J.D. Tippett. Although the diary turned up missing and the issue quickly dropped from view, many researchers scrambled to find any information to confirm the White story. While some evidence was intriguing, such as the fact that Roscoe White and Oswald were on the same ship to Japan in the military, other evidence was found to be disappointing, such as the second diary, which quickly was determined to be a hoax. Jack was interested to learn that Roscoe White was knowledgeable about photography, and in fact, he was slated to become a police photographer. Jack began to look at the Oswald backyard photos with that in mind, and he was amazed at what he found. I believe that people may have been too hasty in writing off the Roscoe White story. There are parts of it which I think may be true. While there's no solid evidence linking Roscoe to the deaths of Kennedy and Tippett, I think he may have played some role, perhaps a minor one, in the conspiracy which resulted in Kennedy's death. I believe Roscoe White was placed on the Dallas police force to help frame Oswald for the assassination. Notice that the person in the backyard photos has a broad, flat chin, while these pictures of Oswald show him with a pointed cleft chin, not at all like the one in the backyard photos. Now look at the chin of Roscoe White, whose chin most closely matches the one in the backyard photos. When I first saw this photo of Roscoe White and some companions on a beach, I immediately noticed Roscoe's thick neck, square chin, and broad shoulders. I also noticed how Roscoe stands with his weight on his right foot. White was about the same height as Oswald. In fact, there were many physical similarities between the two with the exception of the neck and chin. Roscoe had a thick neck with big sloping shoulders while Oswald had a thin neck with narrow shoulders. When I enlarged the photos of Oswald and Roscoe to the same size and laid one over the other, I was astounded to find that the height, posture, and even some features are an identical match. I was especially impressed with the identical neck and chin of the man in the backyard photo and Roscoe White. Also, it is known that Roscoe suffered a broken right wrist which never healed properly and left a slight lump on his arm. Oswald had no such lump. In this backyard photo, there's a noticeable lump on the figure's right wrist. It certainly seems to me that the figure in the photo could be that of Roscoe White. 
And of course, we also have the issue of this third backyard photograph. The Dallas police and the federal government have officially stated that the backyard photos were discovered among Oswald's possessions on Saturday, November 23, 1963, the day after the assassination. They claim that only two photos, one a print and the other a print with a negative, were found. Yet in the early 1970s, this third backyard photograph was discovered by the Senate Intelligence Committee in the hands of Roscoe White's widow. This again ties Roscoe White not only to the assassination case, but specifically to the backyard photos. And there's even more. This FBI document listing photos confiscated from Oswald's belongings indicates four separate pictures showing Oswald with weapons in his backyard. Yet officially, there were only the two. Are there more? And is one the picture which was in the possession of Roscoe White? Many questions regarding the backyard photos remain unresolved, and even more have been raised. This is one of several dozen photographs the Dallas police claimed was found in Oswald's belongings. Apparently it is a photo Oswald took while in the Marines. Uh, there are other photos of Marines and photos of Asian cities. In this photo of Oswald's Marine buddies, I found one person especially intriguing. After comparing the man in the fatigue cap in the center with many photos of Roscoe, I'm convinced they may well be photos of the same man. You can even see a lump on this man's right arm in the exact same place as the person in the backyard photos. I see this as further evidence that the man in Oswald's military photo may be Roscoe White. I believe Roscoe's only role in the assassination may have been to fabricate evidence to help incriminate Oswald. If this is true, it makes Roscoe White's connection to Oswald much closer than previously believed. And if White was involved in intelligence work, as stated by his son and others, then perhaps Oswald too was connected to U.S. intelligence, just as his mother Marguerite always claimed. Well, that's certainly food for thought, Jack. Of course, a, a few photographic comparisons do not conclusively prove that Lee Harvey Oswald was mixed up with intelligence work. What other evidence do we have now that suggests that Oswald was, was more than just a lone disgruntled ex-Marine? To answer the question, we now turn to Dan Foster, who has prepared the following report on Oswald's possible intelligence connections. His information comes from several different public sources. Thank you, Craig. Despite the death of his father shortly before his birth and an overly protective mother, Lee Harvey Oswald had no worse a childhood than millions of other American youngsters. He was a bright student with a willingness to learn if not always follow instructions. During a stay in New York, young Oswald would play hooky from school, but instead of hanging out in the streets, he could be found in the local library or at the zoo. Upon turning 17, Oswald promptly followed his two brothers by volunteering for military service in the United States Marine Corps. But before leaving for the Marines, Oswald was in contact with a very strange character in New Orleans who may well have set him on course with U.S. intelligence. David Ferry wore a wig and false eyebrows due to an unusual disease which left him hairless. A student of drugs, cancer, and religion, Ferry had been an airline pilot before being fired as the result of an arrest on homosexual charges. He also worked directly for Carlos Marcello, the reputed mafia boss of New Orleans, and was connected to the Central Intelligence Agency, as well as an anti-communist operative who once was an FBI agent. In the mid-1950s, Captain Ferry was Oswald's commander in a New Orleans Civil Air Patrol unit. It may have been here that Ferry, the CIA-connected anti-communist, first captivated the impressionable young Oswald with tales of spies and adventure. It was also this same time period that Oswald first began publicly praising the merits of communism, although there was no action to back up his words. Once in the Marines, Oswald's career began showing the telltale marks of intelligence connections. Assigned to the Atsugi base in Japan, he was put in the center of the largest CIA training facility in the Far East. His military records show odd gaps and inconsistencies, which may reflect time spent in intelligence training. There was also the Queen Bee. 
The Queen Bee was one of the three most expensive night spots in Tokyo during Oswald's service in the late 1950s. It catered to officers and pilots, especially those flying the then top secret U-2 spy planes. Military authorities suspected the club's beautiful hostesses were charming sensitive information out of U.S. servicemen, and several were recruited to report on the activities there. One of these servicemen apparently was Lee Harvey Oswald, who was earning less than 90 a month as a Marine private, and much of that was being sent back home to support his mother. Where could Oswald have gotten enough money to afford nights at the Queen Bee? if not from intelligence sources. Apparently, Oswald got more than just intelligence information from his social contacts at the Queen Bee. In this 1958 medical record published by the Warren Commission, we learn that Private Oswald contracted a case of gonorrhea while visiting Tokyo's night spots. Of interest is the line written by Marine medical personnel stating his venereal disease was contracted in the line of duty not through own misconduct. Many veterans find this explanation highly unusual, as the military vigorously warns its troops against contracting venereal diseases. After an unusually quick discharge from the Marines, the 20-year-old Oswald arrived in Moscow after a never fully explained route starting from New Orleans to France, then to England, and on to Finland and Sweden. Although normally a penny pincher with no money, other than what he'd saved in the Marines, Oswald stayed at some of the most prestigious and expensive hotels along the way. After staying in Moscow for almost two weeks and granting interviews to two American correspondents, Oswald finally entered the U.S. Embassy and declared he wanted to dissolve his American citizenship. Oswald even went so far as to tell one embassy official that as a former Marine radar operator, he planned to give the Soviets classified information of special interest. Despite this serious threat, one senior official present, John McVicker, later said he felt Oswald had been tutored in his role as defector, that others were guiding Oswald in his actions. This may account for the fact that Oswald came to the embassy on a Saturday. He was told that he would have to come back on Monday and fill out papers, relinquishing his citizenship during normal business hours. Oswald never returned, and thus never technically defected. Another intriguing aspect of Oswald's attempted defection is that on that Saturday he met with Embassy Second Secretary Richard E. Snyder. Snyder, it was later learned, had previously worked for the CIA, and some researchers suspected that he may have aided Oswald in his renunciation of citizenship which was never a real defection. In the late 1970s, the House Select Committee on Assassinations tried to look into this matter, but was informed by the CIA that Snyder's agency file was not available, quote, as a matter of cover, unquote. It should also be noted that Oswald was not the only American serviceman to try and defect during this same period of time in 1959. Only two servicemen tried to defect in the 14 years between 1945 and 1959. Yet in the 18 months prior to January of 1960, no less than nine U.S. servicemen sought to live in the Soviet Union. All of these would-be defectors had either U.S. military backgrounds or had been involved in sensitive defense work. Former CIA officer Victor Marchetti has stated that in 1959, the Office of Naval Intelligence recruited several dozen young men and trained them to try and enter Russia as disenchanted Americans seeking to defect. The U.S. Marines are under the Department of the Navy. A State Department study to determine which defectors to Russia might be genuine and which might be spies was suddenly shut down without explanation in June of 1963, just as they were about to study the case of Lee Harvey Oswald. This was five months before President Kennedy was assassinated. By all accounts, Oswald did quite well for himself during his year-long stay in Russia. He wrote that he was given money by the Red Cross, but the cash actually came from the Soviet MVD, the secret police. This would-be defector was given a spacious apartment in Minsk, far beyond the means of most Russian workers and he was given work in a radio television factory. Between his Red Cross money and his wages, Oswald was making more money than the director of the factory where he worked. 
Oswald even wrote in his historic diary that he was living big. His easy life in the USSR suggests to many that he had some sort of cozy relationship with Soviet authorities. The fact that Oswald enjoyed a cozy relationship with some intelligence service, if not more than one, is evidence on the speed and ease of his return to the United States in 1962. Reportedly, he became disenchanted with his life under communism, despite having married a Russian woman and applied for a visa to return home. Since he had never technically defected, and despite his threats to give military secrets to the Soviets, Oswald was granted a visa and even loaned money by the U.S. government to return. In government files, it states that Oswald's trip to Russia was with State Department approval. If Oswald's trip was an intelligence mission, there must have been some sort of debriefing upon his return. This may account for his wife, Marina, telling the House Select Committee on Assassinations that when she and Lee arrived in Amsterdam, they stayed not in a hotel, but in some sort of private residence recommended by someone in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. She said they were there for about three days, that advance arrangements had been made for their stay, and that their host spoke English. Back in the United States, Oswald moved around from Fort Worth, where his mother lived, to Dallas, and then on to New Orleans in the summer of 1963. Here he went through the motions of handing out material for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, a lackluster leftist organization urging non-intervention in Cuban affairs. Oswald had written to the committee and stated that he was starting a chapter in New Orleans. Although discouraged in doing so by the committee, Oswald proceeded to set himself up as a one-man chapter of the organization. However, despite his public posturing as a leftist, Oswald's contacts in New Orleans were of a very different persuasion. He was once again seen with his old friend David Ferry, who by this time was working with a right-wing anti-communist private detective named Guy Bannister. Bannister, an ex-FBI special agent who had helped form such anti-Castro groups as the Cuban Revolutionary Democratic Front and Friends of a Democratic Cuba. Bannister's office was in a small two-story building at 544 Camp Street, which had also housed the Cuban Revolutionary Council, an umbrella organization of anti-Castro Cuban groups created by the CIA. During the summer of 1963, Lee Oswald was frequently seen coming and going from 544 Camp Street. Once, when Bannister's secretary told her boss of seeing Oswald with pro-Castro literature, she said he laughed and told her, don't worry about him, he's with us. From his actions and associations, Oswald must have been with someone in the summer of 1963. One of Oswald's friends during that time was Adrian Alba, who managed a parking garage used by U.S. government vehicles near where Oswald worked. He said Oswald would often visit the garage and talk about guns with Alba. On one occasion, Alba recalled an FBI man came in and signed out one of the government cars. He was surprised a short time later to see the same car parked near Oswald's work and Oswald walking over to it. Oswald took a large white envelope from the man in the car, tucked it into his shirt, and quickly walked away, said Alba. He saw this same thing happen the next day. Oswald's political activities continued upon his return to Dallas, where more than one policeman saw him handing out pro-Castro material on a downtown street corner. One policeman said Oswald would simply arrive, hand out his handbills as fast as he could, and then leave. It seems he was more interested in doing a job than in trying to convert passers-by to his way of thinking. During the year and a half between the time Oswald arrived back from Russia and the assassination, he was in contact with more than a half dozen FBI agents. Far more contact with the Bureau than the average young man. Another clue that Oswald may have been involved in spy work is his mention of microdots, both in a personal notebook and to a fellow worker in Dallas. 
A microdot is a commonly used spy technique of photographically reducing information to the size of a small dot, which can be hidden behind postage stamps or in books. Another strong piece of evidence indicating Oswald's intelligence work was found among his possessions by Dallas police. Police noted they found a small Minox camera with the serial number 27259. The small pocket-sized camera is commonly known as a spy camera. The FBI later tried to get the Dallas police to alter their reports and delete mention of the camera. The police refused. Why such attention over this Minox camera? In 1978, the Dallas Morning News reported that Minox Corporation stated that all Minox cameras distributed in the U.S. at the time of the assassination carried a six-digit serial number, beginning with the number 135,000. Obviously, Oswald's five-digit serial number was not commercially available. Who then had issued him the spy camera? And why? Oswald had plenty of opportunity of obtaining such a camera from his contacts. In addition to several FBI agents, one of Oswald's last known close friends was Dallas Petroleum Geologist George de Mornshield. The Russian-born de Mornshield, apart from being very close to Jackie Kennedy's parents, was connected to several intelligence agencies, including the French and Germans, dating back to World War II. In the 1950s, according to CIA documents released in 1978, de Mornshield had provided the agency with foreign intelligence, which was promptly disseminated to other federal agencies in ten separate reports. And one of de Mornshield's closest friends for years was Jim Moore, the CIA's domestic contact officer in Dallas. Obviously, with a friend like de Mornshield, Oswald was in a position to make contact with any number of intelligence agencies. On top of all of this, in 1978, the House Select Committee established that the CIA had a 201 personnel file on Lee Oswald. Agency officials tried to convince the committee that this file, and the fact that they would kept its existence secret for 15 years, was nothing unusual, and did not prove that Oswald had worked for the CIA. However, nearly a half dozen former CIA employees told various researchers that the mere existence of a 201 file on Oswald proved he had worked for the agency. All of the preceding information, plus much more, leaves little doubt that Lee Harvey Oswald, far from being the solitary assassin as stated by the Warren Commission, was a man surrounded by traces of intelligence work. Wow, thanks a lot, Dan. This is going to give us a lot of food for thought. You know, this information wasn't available to us back in the 60s. Now, Jack White, do you agree with this assessment that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was involved in some sort of intelligence work? Uh, yes, Craig, I do. And furthermore, I'd like to show you some of my graphic studies, which have convinced me that when it comes to a study of Lee Harvey Oswald, we are dealing with more than one person. Here are what I call the many faces of Lee Harvey Oswald. The first one on the upper left here is the photograph made of Oswald standing in front of a inch chart taken at the time he joined the Marine Corps in 1956. A couple of years later, when Oswald left the Marine Corps, he had this passport photograph made, and he used it on his passport to go to Russia. Uh, within a month, he arrived in Russia, and this photograph was made of him. It's called the Moscow photo. The fourth picture is the Minsk photo, taken at a time that uh, Lee and Marina lived in Minsk. All four photographs on the bottom are of the man who was killed by Jack Ruby in Dallas. Uh, this photo here was on Oswald's second passport uh, taken in New Orleans in June. Uh, this is the August arrest picture of Oswald made by the New Orleans police uh, when he was arrested for handing out fair play for uh, Cuba handbills. This picture uh, was made in a uh, photo booth and was used by Oswald in Mexico City to apply for a visa to go to Cuba. And uh, the last picture here, of course, is the Dallas police mugshot of uh, Oswald taken uh, November uh, 22nd. Uh, once we look closely 
we, we begin to see that all of these pictures may not be of the same person. The first thing I noticed about this marine photo, aside from the fact that it appears to be some sort of bad photocopy, is that Oswald here has a 13-inch long head, a physical impossibility. I double-checked by placing a man who is the same size as Oswald against a wall height chart just like Oswald, and you can see that the proportions of the Oswald photo are all wrong. There is something very wrong with this photo, and it is not because Oswald was standing away from the height chart, since both he and the wall chart are in focus at the same time. This passport photo and this Moscow photo allegedly were made only a few weeks apart, yet they look like totally different persons. The Moscow photo of Oswald is the only one printed full page size in the Warren Commission volumes, and it too is full of problems. Notice that while one half of his face is in deep shadow indicating a light source from the upper left, the shadow of his body falls to his right. His right shoulder is broad and square, while his left is thin and sloping. We can see traces of retouching on his lips, eyebrow, and hairline. Someone has worked extensively with this photo, but why? I then noticed a notch in his hairline and a fat lower lip on the right. When I connected these points, I discovered that this photo of Oswald suddenly seemed to be a composite photo of two separate people. Then when I straightened his head by leveling his eyes, you can see that his right ear and eyebrow are much too low. Clearly, this is not a genuine photograph. I then studied this photo, reportedly taken of Oswald while he was living in Minsk, and I discovered that this one too has evidence of retouching and also a notch in the chin area. When this photo is split, we again seem to see two separate individuals. I suspected that someone had made another composite photo of two different men to make it appear to be Lee Oswald. I proved this to myself by a simple procedure I call split face composites. Here is Oswald's Dallas Police mugshot. There is no question that this is a photograph of one man, the man in custody in Dallas. This is a split face composite with the right side of Oswald's face being flopped, produced one face made up of the same side. The same was done to the left side. As you can see, there are slight differences since no one's face is perfectly symmetrical. However, it is obviously the face of the same person and the faces are from the same photograph. When I produced a split face composite of the Moscow photo, I found that the two faces did not even look human. Obviously, the faces of the two men in this photo could not be made to match each other. Yet in the Minsk photo, when I made a split face composite, I was amazed to see two separate men's faces. The man on the right seems to be Lee Harvey Oswald, we saw in the newsreels from Dallas, while the man on the left appears only vaguely similar, more like the Marine Oswald. Based on my studies, I have concluded that the Oswald in Dallas was probably the same man who returned from Russia, but in all likelihood was not the same Oswald who joined the Marines. Somewhere between joining the Marines and arriving in Russia, a substitution was made. But Jack, don't you think his wife Marina would know the difference? No, Craig, because she married Oswald after the switch. The man she married is the man that returned to the United States and was arrested in Dallas after the assassination. This is the only Oswald she ever knew. Well, Jack, <laughs> you really have me confused now. You mean to tell me that somebody was posing as Lee Harvey Oswald even before the assassination? Yes, Craig, that's right. Let's say that a man of Russian origin trained as a spy, used the identity of Lee Harvey Oswald, the alleged Marine defector. He is the one who sailed for Europe from New Orleans. Jack, you have to admit, this is rather a bizarre allegation. Now, is there any other evidence other than your graphic studies that indicate that such a substitution did occur? Yes, there is. For example, we now know that on June 3, 1960, three years before the assassination, None other than FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover himself sent this message to the security office of the State Department, warning of the possibility that an imposter was using Oswald's birth certificate. 
You mean to tell us that J. Edgar Hoover was personally aware of Lee Harvey Oswald three years before the assassination? Yes, exactly. And you remember that after the assassination, we were told that no one in the government knew much about Oswald or had paid any attention to him. That's true, Jack. Well, this case is taking more turns than a mountain road. To get a better understanding of all of this, let's check with another authority. We now join Jim Mars, the author of Crossfire, The Plot That Killed Kennedy. Jim has also taught a course on the assassination at the University of Texas at Arlington since 1976. Let's see if he can shed any light on the question of Oswald's identity. First, you have to understand that there's actually two issues here. The first one is, was someone impersonating Lee Harvey Oswald in the weeks leading up to the assassination? And second, was the Oswald who was killed by Jack Ruby in Dallas the same Lee Harvey Oswald who entered the Marines? Now let's look at these issues separately. First we'll look at the evidence that indicates that someone was impersonating Lee Harvey Oswald uh, in the weeks and months leading up to the assassination. And actually this impersonation may have begun as far back as January of 1961. It was at that time that a man identifying himself as Joseph Moore and accompanied by a Cuban man approached Oscar Disley, the manager of a Ford dealership in New Orleans. The men said they were there to buy 10 trucks for use in the campaign against Castro. They said they represented the group Friends of Democratic Cuba, which was one of the anti-Castro organizations founded by Guy Bannister, the ex-FBI detective connected to Oswald in the summer of 1963. In fact, the men said that an Oswald would be paying for the trucks. Disley never heard from the men again, and Mr. Oswald never showed up. But what's intriguing about this story, apart from the obvious Oswald connections with New Orleans, Bannister, and anti-Castro Cubans, is that it occurred during a time that Lee Harvey Oswald was in Russia. The evidence of impersonation continued, in fact increased, after the time that Oswald arrived back in the United States from Russia and as the day of the assassination approached. In the summer of 1963, Oswald was in New Orleans handing out pro-Castro handbills one day and offering his services to anti-Castro Cubans the next. He was seen in the company of Guy Bannister, the ex-FBI man who headed anti-communist groups. He also reportedly was in contact with his old Civil Air Patrol commander, David Ferry, who has been connected to both the CIA and the Mafia. In September, Oswald left for Mexico City. And there was an odd incident in the Selective Service Office in Austin, Texas. On September the 25th, 1963, Mrs. Lee Danley, an official of the Selective Service System in Austin, met with a young man who said he was Harvey Oswald. He said he lived in Fort Worth and wanted to see about getting his military discharge changed back to honorable. Mrs. Donnelly said since she had no paperwork for him that he'd have to talk to the Selective Service Office in Fort Worth. Now, Oswald had lived in Fort Worth, and during the time of his trip to Russia, his honorable Marine discharge had been changed to undesirable. The problem here is that on the date of this meeting with Mrs. Danley, the Warren Commission reported that Oswald was in a bus on his way to Mexico City. Another oddity of Oswald's Mexico visit can be found in this letter he wrote to the Soviet Embassy on November the 9th, 1963. In it, he states, quote, I could not take a chance on requesting a new visa unless I use my real name, so I returned to the United States." End quote. The letter was signed Lee H. Oswald. So what did he mean about using his real name? Is this more evidence of imposture? During Oswald's stay in Mexico City, and some researchers have even questioned whether or not Oswald actually went there, the CIA sent these photos to the FBI claiming that they had photographed a Lee Oswald as he entered the Soviet embassy. They described Oswald as approximately 35 years old with an athletic build about six feet tall with a receding hairline. Obviously, this is not the 24-year-old slightly built five foot nine Oswald arrested in Dallas. There's been no official explanation of who this man might be or why the CIA thought it was Oswald. Now, what I find most intriguing is looking again at this photo from Oswald's belongings. Jack White has said he thinks the Marine in the cap in the background might be Roscoe White. But look at the big man in the foreground. He's a dead ringer for the stocky blonde man in the CIA Mexico City surveillance photo. Is there some connection? 
Well, when you get into the shadowy world of spies and double agents, anything is possible. Another incident, which seems to point to impersonation, occurred in early November 1963 in Irving, Texas. This is the Dallas suburb where Oswald's wife, Marina, was staying with Ruth Payne. A local store owner, Leonard Hutchison, told the Warren Commission that a man resembling Oswald came into his store and tried to cash a two-party check for $189 made out to Harvey Oswald. Hutchison refused to cash the check, but saw the man accompanied by a foreign-speaking woman in his store on several other occasions. Near Hutchinson's store was a barber shop where one barber identified Oswald as a man who had come in for haircuts. This same barber said he saw the Oswald look-alike entering Hutchinson's store. Despite all this, the Warren Commission concluded that since Oswald was not known to have received such a check, Oswald was never in Hutchinson's store. One of the best known incidents occurred when a man who introduced himself as Lee Oswald shopped for a car at downtown Lincoln Mercury in Dallas. The man entered the showroom on November the 9th, 1963, and went for a test drive with salesman Albert Bogard. Bogard said Oswald drove 60 to 70 miles an hour along Stimmons Expressway, scaring him to death, and told him he would be coming into money soon. The Warren Commission dismissed Bogard's story because it established that Oswald had no driver's license and was just learning to drive at the time. Furthermore, on the particular day in question, he was with his wife, and Ruth Payne all day. Yet another incident occurred shortly after the assassination when some Dallas employees of Western Union told newsmen they remembered a man matching Oswald's description collecting money orders. They said they remembered him because he was rude to the clerks. One employee said he recalled the man was with another man of Spanish descent and used a Navy ID card with the name Oswald. The Warren Commission after Western Union officials failed to turn up any such money orders in Oswald's name, dismissed the story. But another story, which was harder to dismiss, involved the service manager of the Irving Sports Shop. After the assassination, the man reported that he had worked on a rifle for a man named Oswald. He had an undated check stub with the name Oswald on it to substantiate his story. However, the manager said the stub indicated that three holes were bored in the rifle so as to mount a telescopic sight. The rifle found at the Texas School Book Depository had only two holes for the sight. And furthermore, the sports shop manager said the rifle he worked on was not the Italian Manlicher Carcano identified as the assassination weapon. Well, whose weapon was it? And was there someone using Lee Harvey Oswald's name? The Warren Commission never troubled to find out. Other incidents occurred prior to the assassination at Dallas' sports drone rifle range. Shooters there recall seeing a man closely resembling Oswald practicing with a rifle just weeks before the assassination. One man even helped adjust the sight on the rifle. On a later occasion, an argument erupted after the Oswald character began firing on a target belonging to Garland Slack. It was as, as if the man wanted people at the range to remember him. However, again, Oswald was known to be elsewhere, prompting the Warren Commission to state, quote, although the testimony of these witnesses was partially corroborated by other witnesses, there was other evidence which prevented the commission from reaching the conclusion that Lee Harvey Oswald was the person that these witnesses saw. Now, about a month before the assassination, Mrs. Lovell Penn discovered three men practicing with a rifle in a field near her home. She ordered the men to leave and picked up a 6.5 millimeter shell casing they had left behind. After the assassination, Mrs. Penn turned the casing over to the FBI and told them that one of the men was Hispanic and another looked like pictures of Lee Harvey Oswald. The FBI reported that the shell casing had not been fired through the Oswald rifle. An Oswald seen in the company of Hispanic or Cuban men is a common thread in the pre-assassination sightings. One of the most well-documented concerns a Cuban refugee named Sylvia Odio, who by 1963 was living in Dallas and was active in the anti-Castro Cuban movement. In late September, she was visited by two Latins, accompanied by an Anglo, who was introduced to her as Leon Oswald. The men said they were raising funds for anti-Castro activities and wanted her support. Later, one of the men called Sylvia Odio and gave her more details on Leon Oswald. The caller said Oswald was an ex-Marine, an expert marksman who had remarked that the Cubans should have shot President Kennedy after the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion. Shocked, 
Odio broke off the conversation, but did not officially report the incident until after the assassination when she said she recognized Lee Harvey Oswald as the Anglo who had come to her apartment. The Warren Commission concluded that on the day Odio was visited by the three men, Lee Harvey Oswald was in a bus on his way to Mexico City. Now this is just another example of either someone impersonating Oswald in a very incriminating way or of Oswald being in two places at the same time. Thank you, Jim. Well, there you have it. Strong evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald not only was working in some sort of intelligence capacity, but that someone was impersonating him in a way to incriminate him in the assassination before the fact. We now come to the most bizarre issue of this investigation. As you've seen, the evidence that someone at one time or another impersonated Lee Harvey Oswald is overwhelming. Even J. Edgar Hoover suspected it, and Oswald was obviously mixed up in some sort of intelligence activity. But was the Oswald who was killed by Jack Ruby in Dallas the same Oswald who joined the Marines? It seems incredible. But some assassination researchers believe that the real Oswald was replaced by another man who posed as Oswald and was accused of murdering President Kennedy. Not only have J. Edgar Hoover and assassination researchers questioned the true identity of the Oswald killed in Dallas, in 1967, just four years after the events in Dallas, Marguerite Oswald, Lee's own mother, asked for an exhumation of her son's grave, expressing questions about scars on her son's body. His mother was not the only person to quickly reveal doubts as to the identity of the Oswald killed in Dallas. According to funeral home director Paul Grudy, the man who buried Oswald, Secret Service agents approached him only three weeks after Oswald's burial and asked him about scars on the body. Grudy said they were trying to figure out why Oswald's body did not have the same scars which were known to have been on Oswald's arms. Grudy quoted one of the Secret Service agents as saying, we don't know who we have in that grave. And there are definitely questions and inconsistencies about scars and even the height of Oswald. This Marine medical report made around the time Oswald was discharged from the service in September of 1959 shows he was 71 inches tall. That's 5 foot 11. Yet Oswald's official autopsy report shows that the man killed in Dallas was only 5 foot 9 inches tall. That's a discrepancy of two inches. This problem with Oswald's height is reflected in this comparison between his marine photo and a later picture. While all the facial features do match, the heads are of a different size. This marine physical examination of Oswald made on September the 3rd, 1959, shows the marine Oswald had a scar and depression behind his left ear from a mastoid operation as a child. It also lists a VSULA, which stands for Vaccination Scar Upper Left Arm, a common mark for American children born in the 1930s and 1940s. Yet neither the mastoid nor the vaccination scar were noted in the otherwise thorough autopsy of the Oswald killed in Dallas. Furthermore, a close reading of the Warren Commission volumes reveals that even Oswald's own family questioned his appearance after his return from Russia. His mother noted that her son's formerly thick, dark hair was lighter and thinning after he returned to the United States. She said Oswald claimed he was going bald because of the cold weather. In other testimony, Oswald's brother Robert noted that not only had his brother's hair changed, but also his complexion, which was much darker than he remembered. Robert also noted he appeared to be rather tense and anxious. He appeared to have picked up something of an accent. Oswald's half-brother, John Edward Pick, told the Warren Commission, quote, I would have never even recognized him. He was much thinner than I remembered. He didn't have as much hair. His facial features were somewhat different. His face was rounder. Now, Pick also noted that when Oswald was in the Marines, he had a, a bull neck, but the man who came back from Russia had a thin neck. In later years, Pick was even more outspoken, telling author Renatus Hartog, quote, the Lee Harvey Oswald I met in November 1962 was not the same Lee Harvey Oswald I had known 10 years previously. Now let's return to Jack White and see what he can tell us about the photos of Oswald during this period. Jack? Yes, Craig, as I pointed out earlier, the photos of Oswald after his return from Russia all appear to be the same person, but the photos made before and during his trip to Russia uh, appear to be open to question. 
This photo, supposedly of Oswald taken in Moscow, seems to be of two separate individuals. This is also true of this photo reportedly made of Oswald in Minsk. Again, it seems to be a composite photo of two different men. And here's another point. I find this photograph of Oswald and Marina standing on a bridge in Minsk especially intriguing. Marina is five foot three inches tall and the man beside her is only two and a half inches taller, much shorter than Oswald's five foot 11 inch marine height or even his five foot nine inch Dallas height. To add to this mystery, look at this letter Oswald wrote to his mother shortly before returning to the United States from Russia. He writes, quote, if you have any old photos of myself and of you also, please send them, unquote. Since he would be home shortly, why would he want old photos of himself and his mother? Well, Jack, uh, maybe he wanted to make sure that they would recognize each other upon his return. It's certainly a strange request, isn't it? We also know that Oswald carried two sets of identification on him, some in the name of Lee Harvey Oswald, and some, such as the Selective Service Card, as Alec James Hydell. So there seems to be a serious question over the identity of the man in Dallas we know as Lee Harvey Oswald. Even his own family noted differences in the man who returned from Russia. One theory to explain all of this was advanced in 1977 by British author Michael Eddowes in this book, The Oswald File. Now Eddowes claimed that the real Oswald was held in Russia while a KGB agent who closely resembled Oswald was sent back to the United States for the purpose of assassinating President Kennedy. Now, do you agree with this theory, Jack? No, I don't, Craig. I think a compelling argument can be made that if a substitution of Oswald was made, it was made just prior to his trip to the Soviet Union. In other words, the real Oswald, the Marine Oswald, was released from the military, briefly visited his mother in Fort Worth, and then left for New Orleans. I think a substitute Oswald, perhaps coached by Oswald himself, was sent as a spy to Russia. It was this substitute who arrived in Moscow and went through the motions of defection. It was also this substitute that spoke fluent Russian, married a Russian woman, and returned to the United States. Back in the U.S., this substitute was embroiled in the assassination conspiracy by his intelligence handlers. And Jack, you don't believe that the assassination was the work of the KGB or the Soviets? No, I do not. For one thing, there was no purpose for the Soviets to kill Kennedy. All they could expect from such an act was the presidency going to Lyndon Johnson, well known for his anti-communism. Also, such action could have led to World War III. Plus, we have to consider the massive amount of evidence which ties the Dallas Oswald to men connected with the CIA, the FBI, and the anti-Castro Cubans. I think we should stop and point out here that in our study of this issue was the man killed in Dallas, the real Lee Harvey Oswald, we found that back in 1981, such questions led to an exhumation of Oswald's grave in Fort Worth's Rose Hill Cemetery. The body was taken to Baylor Medical Center in Dallas, where four prominent forensic pathologists compared the corpse's teeth to Oswald's marine medical records. And while they did find some differences, they found enough similarities to conclude that the body in the grave was indeed that of Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, Jack, didn't that exhumation pretty well put an end to the speculation that an imposter was posing as Oswald at the time of the assassination? Well, it certainly did as far as the news media and the public went, but I learned some things later which shocked me and raised the entire question of an Oswald imposter all over again. And what was that, Jack? I discovered that the x-rays used to identify the exhumed corpse were made at Santa Ana, California on March 27, 1958. Yet there are other marine records showing that Oswald was still in Japan at that time. There seem to be two separate medical records of the marine Oswald, which I find very puzzling. One set seems to be for the real Oswald. The other seems to be for his substitute using Oswald's name. This latter record contains the dental x-rays. A few months after the exhumation, I happened to be at a local basketball game when I encountered Paul Grudy, uh, the funeral home director who buried Oswald in 1963 and who was present at the 1981 exhumation. He confided to me that both he and the other funeral director, Alan Baumgartner, who had assisted Grudy in burying Oswald and who also was at the 1981 exhumation, agreed that the body, which was dug up in 1981, was not the same body they had buried in 1963. Wow, that's incredible. What basis do they have for believing this? 
It's a fact that when the Dallas Oswald was autopsied after death, that the skull was sawed open in order for the brain to be examined, like this. This is a normal autopsy procedure called a craniotomy. Both Grudy and Baumgartner say that the skull of the body that was exhumed in 1981 was intact. No sign of the craniotomy. Jack, that seems inconsistent. Have, have any of the authorities responsible for the exhumation offered an explanation? Yes. After more than two years, the medical officer in charge of the exhumation finally published the results and noted that there indeed was a craniotomy performed on the Oswald corpse, but that decomposed mummified skin had held the skull together, making it appear that no craniotomy was performed. This explanation was not acceptable to the two morticians, so there the matter stands. More controversy, more questions. Jack, is there any independent way of determining whether or not the skull in 1981 had a craniotomy saw cut? Yes, a, a videotape was made of the 1981 exhumation and study. And I think if researchers could view this tape, it might resolve this issue once and for all. Unfortunately, the photographer who was hired by Oswald's wife, Marina, has refused to give her the tape despite a court order to do so. So until such time as we can review the exhumation videotape, we are left with more unanswered questions about the identity of the man killed by Jack Ruby in 1963. Are all these photographs of the same man? Is this Lee Harvey Oswald? Or this? Or is this? Or this? Or this? The evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald was some sort of intelligence agent who worked for, or believed he worked for, the United States government is almost overwhelming. Likewise, there can be little doubt that in the weeks leading up to the assassination, someone was impersonating Oswald in a very incriminating way. With this in mind, we must start over in our assessment of the assassination of President Kennedy. Perhaps the evidence against Oswald was fabricated, just as he claimed. After all, Oswald told the news media in Dallas the weekend of the assassination, I didn't shoot anybody, I'm just a patsy. Well, there you have it. It's bizarre, it's intriguing, it's the biggest murder mystery in the history of our nation. The attack upon President John F. Kennedy was an attack upon our Constitution and our system of government. We must learn the truth. Yet for now, as for the past three decades, we are still left with many questions and too few answers. We are left to wonder about the many faces of the man buried here. And we have to ask, who was Lee Harvey Oswald? Add to your assassination library today. Order Chapter 1, the collector's edition of Fake. No collection is complete without this thought-provoking documentary about the Oswald and Kennedy story. Now available at fine bookstores is Jim Marr's best-selling investigative report, Crossfire, The Plot That Killed Kennedy. Crossfire, one of the foundation books of the new Oliver Stone movie, JFK.